overloading the cases here and no enough beds no enough medications no enough doctors and no enough nurses Hello, I'm Rula Jibriel. I'm a journalist, author, and a foreign policy expert. Uh, I would love to welcome two remarkable Yemeni women today. We will speak about the war, the forgotten war in Yemen, a war that we don't talk about in the media too often. We're too busy with Sormi and other things. Uh, the UN last week said that the war in Yemen created the worst humanitarian crisis since the founding of the United Nations itself. With me will join me two remarkable women, uh, Afra Nasser, who is an award-winning journalist and a blogger who is exiled in Sweden. And here is a friend of mine who I actually admire her work great, greatly, and uh, Bushra al khubaidi And she's wearing a niqab. Uh, she's wearing a niqab because her work, uh, Yemen Care, is under threat. They provide shelter for people, they provide uh, food, they provide medical aid, but they are threatened because they work in the worst uh, areas in Yemen. And I will start with you. You just flew from Yemen, and I know that uh, you've been working so hard on the issue since the beginning. But also you have two master degrees, and when you married your husband, you put as a condition to marry him that he would accept that you pursue your degrees. Is that accurate? That's absolutely right. Can you please tell us about the magnitude of the crisis in Yemen today? Um, actually, what's happening in Yemen is so difficult to explain for people living in uh, this life and what's going on in Yemen, because it's, it's massive needs and massive, massive crisis. As uh, you just mentioned, the UN declared that it's uh, the worst crisis that is happening nowadays. You could imagine, like, out of 27 million people, 22.2 uh, .2 million are in massive need for different type of needs. They are in need of food, they are in need of clean water, they are in need of shelter, they are in need of uh, health and nutrition, education. This is what's happening in Yemen. It's a forgotten war that is nobody talking about. Nobody knows what's going on in Yemen. Hardly some people know where Yemen is in the map. So what's happening here, we're talking about death of people, death of men and women and innocent children who had no, nothing to do with that. They had nothing to do with that. They just woke up and sometimes they don't wake up just to find themselves in the, uh, without any, any basic services of life, without food, without shelter, homeless, and might also have lost their own beloved ones. So, Bushra, you arrived, um, you managed displaced people, refugees, and you find yourself in that situation. Can you explain to us, please, uh, in numbers, the, the crisis? The UN says that every uh, hour, uh, every day, actually, in Yemen, there are one and 130 children who die. There's 50,000 children who, who died since the beginning of this crisis. There's almost 2 million people who uh, ha are in need of health care, and there's cholera. Can you tell us about these diseases that disappeared from our history, but they, there's outbreak of these diseases in Yemen? 
Let me start with my displacement story. When I used to work for, for CARE, I joined CARE in 2010, and when we were started to provide the humanitarian assistance to the people providing education, walk, clean water, food, and economic resources for them to empower men and girls and children as well. In 2015, I found myself being displaced by force. I had no choice other than to run after my life and to escape with my kid and my husband and also look for um, my staff who were working in that area. We found ourselves like, facing the same critical situation where p displaced people are. I cannot, rem I cannot forget that day when I, I, that feeling, the bitter of leaving home behind, leaving everything behind. My, my son was telling me, mommy, can I take my toys with me? And I was like, Yusuf, I don't think there is time for this. Let's just run for our life. There was no time even to pick my, my son's toys. That's, I cannot like forgive myself that I didn't even listen to him because I told him, we're gonna come back. This is just, it's not, it's not gonna take more than two weeks, a month maximum. But what happened is like, we were never able to come back. And millions of people are not able to come back to their homes. They've lost their homes, they've lost their lives. We were displaced again to another place. We are, I, I stayed with my sister, and then uh, like airstrikes were there where two family members died. And I had to witness this death. My son, the 12 years old now, has witnessed this. And when he was asking me why this is happening, why my best friend has died, the, the same age he is just died for no reason. When he asked me this question, I couldn't answer this. But he told you something when you came here. What is the message that uh, Yusuf asked you to carry to the American audience here, to the women of today? That was just two days right before I come here. There was heavy airstrikes in the hotel where we were staying together and we were just holding each other and it was so terrible, it was so close and we thought this is something really serious which is like every day we're facing but then we were just holding each other. He was just hugging me and he said, Mommy, go and save Yemen. Because he thinks that somebody has to do something. And he would be the most affected person of me leaving him behind in the country. That's a Yusuf picture behind us. Please look at him and when you think about Yemen. <clears throat> Afra, I want to ask you. So clearly, we don't know much about Yemen. But can you explain to us how this conflict started and who are the players? Well, um, before I answer your question, uh, I want to ask the audience, how many of you were, wh what's going on in Yemen? How many of you know? Please raise that, your that hands. Anybody in? heard about Yemen? That's, okay. that's improvement, actually. I was expecting none. But um, coming to the US for the second time, I've and even working internationally, covering Yemen and, and speaking about you know, the international aspect uh, to the conflict in Yemen. I'm, I'm s uh, struggling myself as a journalist to pitch stories and publish because not a lot of people want to know about what's happening in Yemen or publish something about the war in Yemen. Absolutely, Yemen is underreported. It's, it's in comparison to the conflict in Syria or um, you know, natural disasters. Yemen is not uh, getting, uh, you know, equivalent uh, media attention. And also, uh, considering that it is the largest, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world today, it's not getting enough media attention. And it's, this is very shocking for me, especially for, you know, American audience, while Yemenis themselves on the ground know that this war is not only uh, the Saudi-led coalition uh, airstrike or war, it's also the American uh, bombs falling on, on their heads and, and falling on their houses. Um, when I call my family, like my mom is busy going to a funeral or coming back from a funeral. Death is everywhere. If the airstrikes uh, don't kill you, the lack of medicine and food and the cholera and the diseases will definitely kill, kill you. Um, it's, it's a very, very tragic situation, uh, and Yemenis know that the weapons falling on them are American-made. Uh, only in 2018, 
uh, Donald Trump uh, signed a weapon deal with Saudi uh, uh, MBS uh, uh, with you know, $12.5 uh, billion. So actually, there are internationally banned uh, weapons that were dropped uh, in Yemen by the Saudi-led coalition that are reportedly uh, by you know, the, the reports from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty that are uh, you know, sealed with Western uh, governments. So clearly, what's happening in Yemen is being assisted and supported by uh, Western uh, powers that are allies to the Saudi-led coalition. And on the same time, there are a raging civil war on the ground where there are, there are rebel groups that are targeting systematically civil, uh, civilian areas such as in Taiz or other areas. And it's, uh, I mean, Yemenis are terribly suffering by all these sides. Yemen is literally under fire from multi fronts. And, th and nobody has to, to, you know, nobody has to live in that situation. So Saudi, the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was here after a spree of uh, kidnapping his own relatives in, uh, in Riyadh. He came here. He was received by Donald Trump by every elite group from Silicon Valley to Hollywood, celebrated with everybody. He's on the cover of Time magazine, and he's been called reformist. While he was defense minister, that was his signature policy. Can you tell us about how uh, this forgotten war, underreported war, is can, can, can be the juxtaposition between us calling this man who's leading that war and the blockade a reformist and what's happening on the ground. It's actually thanks to such uh, groups like Women in the World that are you know, doing, I mean, and when it comes to the American civil society organization, they are doing a remarkable job in trying to challenge that kind of narrative. When it comes to the government, I mean, I'm, I don't have any hope with, you know, the U.S., uh, the White House administration being, you know, uh, a, a, an ally to MBS and giving a green light of committing whatever uh, MBS would like to commit in, in Yemen. And I, I find it shocking that uh, we could call a, reformer, a reformist uh, the MBS, uh, while he's waging a war in, in, in the poorest Arab country, um, how could we call him a reformist when he's, uh, you know, uh, enforcing a blockade that are, I mean, intentionally and deliberately using uh, food as a weapon of war, blocking food for people to, uh, uh, in, in, in Yemen? Uh, blocking access for journalists to go and report uh, what's happening in Yemen, blocking um, medicine, blocking people f for people to flee. When you think about Yemen being surrounded by these monarchies that are coming together to bomb this poorest Arab country. So uh, this, is, this is cruelty. And yet, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, the U.S. media was glorifying the reforms he was making back home. And I think... They, it was just a disgrace uh, to, not, to dismiss uh, the disastrous policies MBS is doing in Yemen. And it's thanks to such organization that we are trying to send the message, and hopefully the audience will be you know, enlightened. Bushra, I want to ask you about this. And, and so Americans understand very well the costs of any war. Uh, in the 80s, 79, there was Afghanistan. Uh, that unholy alliance with the jihadists, then many years after, Afghanistan became the playground for jihadists. Can Yemen become that in less than five years? A playground for jihadists, radicalization, there's no education. I would say, and I would add to what Afrah mentioned about the, the 2.5 billion that was bought for weapons. I would say, if we had all this money just to save the people in Yemen, what remarkable change we would have done. And I'm afraid to say that from what I see in the ground, from the people I see and the people I work with and I assist back in Yemen, I'm afraid to say that Yemen is going to be worse than Afghanistan. So it will come back to hunt us, to hunt even the Americans who are unaware of what's going on on the ground. The, the problem is what's happening in Yemen is it's, it's multiple crises. It's only not man-made. We have 
epidemics that has been like disappeared for decades, who would have like imagined that cholera is back to the history? And it's just happening in Yemen. You yourself had a fever. And would you like to talk about your health condition? Uh, yes, uh, actually I had a dengue fever and this is one also one of the killing diseases back in Yemen. So you could see the people are dying from the cholera, from the airstrikes, from the uh, ground fighting, from the uh, dengue fever, from the daffeteria. There are several diseases. You could have, like, it's too, too hard to put uh, all together in your mind. And the blockade is forbidding the medications to come. Absolutely. And that is Saudi Crown Prince signature. When I got sick back in January, I, I had the access to the facilities, to medical facilities, but it was really poor. And I was like going through, I thought that it's going to be it. I thought this is the end of my life because it was really serious. And I was just thinking, what if, how people are just surviving because this, uh, uh, like I would have imagined like women in the rural areas or anywhere, they don't have access. I was just dying and I had the access to the medical services. I had the people around me. I was like with my family at home and I had all the facilities. And for the poor people, they had no other choice other than just die. Afra, what can we do here in the United States to pressure our politicians or even to help Yemen? What can we do from it's, here? It's, what can any of, of the people sitting in this It's audience? tragic, tragic what's happening in Yemen. Um, as someone who lived in Sweden, I, I think animals are better treated than uh, how Yemenis are living, the, the conditions Yemenis are, are forced to live uh, with. Um, I get inspired by how, you know, the anti-war movement in the U.S. during uh, the Vietnam War. And I think I, I want, like, more and more of, you know, the Americans to go and be, uh, to speak out against the war in Yemen and help pressure your senators to raise uh, Yemen at the Congress. Because at the Congress, that's where our hope is. If uh, you know, your, your representatives are speaking uh, against the, the, the American role in Yemen. At least we can help in stopping one actor in the war. Yemen is being, you know, uh, splitting into an international war. And you could, you could uh, bring peace to Yemen if you speak out and write to your representatives and write to them, why, what are we doing in Yemen? Why people are living with, in famine? Why people are, like Bushra have to live through, uh, you know, such diseases that are supposed to be, you know, uh, left in history that our civilization dealt with a long time before. So I, I believe in the American uh, people. I don't believe in the, in the government or in uh, the White House. But I believe that if Americans actually fix politics in this country, they could put an end to the war in Yemen. And I Ushra, also yeah. want to ask you, uh, how can we help your organization care Yemen? That's what I wanted to say. It's, uh, it's not only one thing that can be done to Yemen. There are many things that can be done to Yemen to help, uh, uh, like, stopping what's happening. Uh, I think peace is the first thing that we would call for because within the like uh, funding uh, uh, organizations like CARE and uh, INGOs who are helping the people in Yemen is not going to be enough. Peace has to come first. How can we just stop uh, or, or help the people while, while they are like still not safe, so, like death is being faced every day. So peace is the first thing that we should call for and advocate for this to make it happen. And I think as a woman, it's as a woman leader, and I'm, I'm sure like all this stage with, with uh, wonderful women all over the world can make the difference. And this is what we are born for, to make the, the world a better place for us and for others. And I must say, uh, while Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, was in Paris after his trip here, uh, human rights organizations are suing him for um, torture, for rape in Yemen, and for the use of weapons that are banned. Uh, I must say, it was an honor to be with these incredible, brave, remarkable women, and I would love to thank, especially women in the world, and Tina Brown, for talking and bringing center stage 
this crisis in Yemen. In the Arab world, we say that the richest country in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, is bombing to oblivion the poorest country, which is Yemen, with the help of the Americans. And I, I, I think people also have to remember that what Martin Luther King once said, that injustice anywhere is the threat to justice here. So uh, protect justice globally and bring peace to Yemen. One last word. One last word to you, Bushra. If you have to think about your son's future in 10 years from today, he's 12, when he will be 22, how do you see his future? That's a very difficult question because I'm afraid I don't know where he's going to be if this is not stopping. I think if not, if not, he's not dead, hopefully somewhere else better. Thank you, Bushra, and I really recommend your courage and bravery. Thank you. Very competitive. I know what I want.